And tonight is going to be, um, it's posted as from our library as a two part series, but um, thank, to, uh, thank you to Mary Hogan at the Cora Belden Library. It's, we're gonna make it a three part gardening series and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. All righty, I think it's 7.01 and I think, how are we doing, Victoria? Anybody in the waiting room? Um, I don't believe so. Oh, wait, there's two more. Oh, oh, keep letting them in. That's great. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, all right. Then I'm going to start. Okay, we're starting all over. I just sat here. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Michelle, I do have one yep. thing. Um, Elizabeth um, is Elizabeth F. Weathersfield. I don't know if she wants yep, to Yeah, right there, yep. Yeah. Yep, so she just, that's, she's from Weathersfield. <laughs> okay, all right. Librarians. Okay. Yeah, I just, I tried to change my name and it wouldn't let me change it. So I just wanted any Weathersfield patrons to know that I'm here if they have any questions about our participation in the series. So um that's all. So hi, I'm Elizabeth from the Weathersfield Library. Just want to make sure that you know I'm here if you need to contact me about anything. So we're happy to have you all here um, as, as this partnership, as we do this program as a partnership between several libraries. So thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, Mary Hogan from Rocky Hill is also on the call. If um, Mary, if you wanted to say anything to, to Rocky Hill patrons at this time. <laughs> and I know sometimes she's on the floor, we're at the library working while we're also doing the program, <laughs> but what we've been doing is a collaboration between uh, Newington and Weathersfield and Rocky Hill and uh, Berlin. So it's been great. We just did a genealogy series and now this is going to be a gardening series that we'll be doing. So it's going to be in three different um, times. So the first one is going to be, um, it's our series is called in Newington, How Does Your Garden Grow? And so tonight is Backyard com Composting. Our second series, if you're interested, our second part is Keeping Your Vegetable Garden Happy and Healthy Through the Growing Season. And that is with Plant Her Gardening Coaching. And that will be our second one on June 1st. And then the third one will be, um, offered again um, by the three libraries. Um, Mary Hogan was able to get this for us. And that is um, Around the World in 80 Hello. Garden. And it's by a CCSU professor. And his name is Professor uh, Benfield. And so he is a retired uh, professor from Central. So tonight we're working with Master Gardeners and their names are Pete and Tricia Halvardson. And they're gonna tell us a little bit about the University of Connecticut's Master Gardener program and a lot about backyard composting. So I think um, at this time, we'll bring up the first slide. Okay. And I will um, let you guys introduce, take over and give us anything that you'd like to tell us. Thank you very much for doing this program for us tonight. Sure. And I will just mention again, just if everybody can put their microphones on mute. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be referring back to them. Okay, take it away, guys. Hi. Uh, tonight, I would like to present information on composting, more of the application of backyard, you know, homeowner composting. I'm Pete Halbertson. I'm Trisha. Uh, we're both master gardeners and master composters. Uh, the master gardener program through the University of Connecticut like most states uh, with university, state universities and that have agriculture programs, they all have generally, I think every state, a master gardener program um, that's run, that provides for those that uh, participate about eight months worth of classes and practical experience and projects um, where you learn from speakers as well as uh, your own self-paced work. Now, many of them in the last three or four years have become more online and, and in the last year, certainly a lot more distance learning, uh, but they, they still exist. And then they also have a component of Master Gardener is some discussion on composting, but there's a separate Master Composting program run by Dawn Petinelli, who runs the soil lab at uh, University of Connecticut. And that's about four, um, I'm not gonna say lectures, but opportunities for people that compost to come that are, are mostly academic or very experienced composters speak to the 
people that sign up, um, and also field trips to some commercial composting operations. And you get an exposure to a lot of a lot of a lot of people, and you learn a lot of their experience. Um, our contact information is at the at the bottom there. If you want to jot it down, or feel free to email us. If, you, if we don't are unsuccessful at answering your questions or touching on a topic that you really wanted to hear, um, feel free to contact us. Uh, we don't have all the answers. Um, we're not in the profession. We're not in the gardening or landscaping. We're not scientists, botanists, or any of those things. Uh, we're, we're homeowners. We've been composting for over 30 years. Um, so we have experience. And frankly, a lot of the information we are going to present tonight is, you know, the advent of the internet. It, it's, it's out there. And most of the state universities have great websites with a lot of great composting information uh, for you to go to, and I encourage it. They're usually, University of Missouri is one, um, for instance, that is really good. University of Connecticut is good as well. Um, there's .orgs, which are other organizations that are, are, are very well reputed and um, well researched that provide information. But frankly, some of the dot coms and YouTube videos that people put out there that show what they're doing are also very good. Um, one of the, I guess, aspects that are stressed to us when you go through these programs um, is that if you get something from a dot com or a YouTube video, uh, it may pay to go to a dot org or dot edu and kind of reinforce it or validate it in some way. But there's just so much information out there. In fact, if you've been looking at all, I'm not sure how much we'll present that's new from information, uh, but one of the benefits of a presentation like this or these programs is you get to share your experiences because between information and practical um, experience, there's a lot subject to interpretation. Some things you read about don't work, but it might work for someone else. So that type of interaction, interface with people uh, pays off and that's the type of programs. Both these programs um, do have a certification. There is projects, there's some tests, there's um, commitments um, to do outreach in the community, like farmers markets and such. Um, set up a table and say, I'm a master composter and people have a chance to come and ask questions. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and very rewarding. Um, anything else I should? No, I think you offer? summed it up. Okay. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is go on. Uh, would like to um, start off sharing a little bit of experience as far as at farmers markets and people that come up to us when we're doing outreach, primarily are people that have not composted, but they'd like to, but are put off for some reason. And the questions that we get are usually in this category of five questions. They're afraid that it's going to attract bears. So one of the attract bears, raccoons, rats, something like that. that we've never had that. Um, I don't think you hang something out there that is in the primary food group of a bear if you live in an area where there's bears. That wouldn't be a good idea. But in, in residential areas or even in you know, quasi, you know, um, um, less residential, but more uh, open communities uh, from a, from a, from a um, forest and out, um, undeveloped property. Uh, we really, you don't, you're not putting things in the compost, it's breaking down. You're not putting things in there generally that is in the major food groups. They're really not bothersome. We get a lot about, I don't want to smell, my neighbors will complain. Uh, you, won't, you won't find that. You could certainly do things that would cause it to smell, but not if you just follow the general principles and practices. Uh, we've met people that said, hey, I'd compost. What am I going to do with it all? I don't have a garden. I don't have anything to do with it. Well, you can just spread it over your lawn. You can spread it in any area. It can just act as an amendment. You don't have to put it in a garden. You don't have to have a garden. The, the amount of work you have to put in, because people are sometimes afraid of the amount of work, because it seems like it, um, it, you can do as little as you want and as much as you want. You can study it as much as you want. You can um, just let it work itself as much as you want. So it's really not a lot of work, but it is something you have to kind of keep up with and, and, and somewhat of a little bit of a routine. But you can go away, you can go on vacation, it's gonna just keep compost and you don't have to worry about it. You don't need to hire a compost sitter. Um, and a lot of people understand that you're gonna have kitchen waste, which is great for the compost, and you're gonna collect it while you're preparing the meals and you're gonna put it somewhere. You're not gonna make five trips out to the compost bin. So you put it in a container, it's on the counter and some people are really put off by that. They, or they don't want it underneath their sink. They're afraid it will smell. I mean, that, that kind of comes along with composting. You're gonna to have to contain it. You're gonna to have to bring it out when it gets full and it's gonna be in your kitchen. Um, 
but it's more, I think for people that want to do it and feel the rewards of it, it's more a badge of honor than, than a nuisance. But some people might think it's unattractive. So this information we have kind of grouped, uh, there's a number of topics we're going to touch on. Um, none of them that are going to get into a real, real detailed uh, discussion. A lot of the detail is available online. If something here strikes uh, an interest that you want to know more about, uh, if we can't answer the question um, between the general principles of composting, the type of structures um, and other elements of composting. And then, um, as I mentioned, one of the benefits of not getting information from the internet um, and but talking to people and hearing them is that you can get their experience, what they have found has worked or not worked or what they think is valuable to the topic. So in orange through this presentation, we tried to highlight things that will identify to you. It's what we do. I mean, we this is our experience. This is what uh, our practice has been. And there's other practices, but between Trisha and I, this is uh, what we've done. So if you see something in orange, generally that will we'll address it as our practice experience. Uh, the why compost. Compost gives a product that has nutrients. It's not a fertilizer, but has nutrients for your plants. Whether you spread it on the lawn, it's good for the, for the lawn and the garden, whether it's herbaceous flowers or whether it's vegetables. Um, it provides a really good nutritious um, um, resource for your plants and they become happy, healthy plants. And you need, generally you will find you need less amendments and less fertilizer or less things to add to the garden. Uh, it's an excellent conditioner for the soil. It's it's kind of clumpy, it's it's airy, it's fluffy, and it's good. Um, worms love crawling through it because in your compost bin, they'll be there. But when you put it in the garden, they also love it there. And that's good for aerating. It's good for the roots of, of the plants. It also, from an altruistic standpoint, you're going to cut down a lot on waste. We hardly put anything out of the curbside. Um, and most of what we put out is just from our, our kitchen scraps. Um, so it just, it, it, it's beneficial in terms of reducing what might end up going to an incinerator or the landfill. And we feel better doing it, and you might too. So what is compost? All organic matter will decompose with time, but composting makes it go a little faster. So there's a coal pile and a hot pile. A coal pile will just decompose on its own. A hot pile is doing things to make it work a little bit faster. But don't worry, your compost will succeed with or without you. So we're gonna talk a little science today, but it's not that complicated. Don't forget your compost will succeed anyway. So we'll give you a plan to get compost in a few minutes. I mean, a few months, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you are not, but if you're not in a rush, just put the ingredients together, stir it occasionally, and you'll have compost eventually. So composting is the controlled microbial decomposition of organic matter. Microbes are important, such as food and yard waste by bacteria and microorganisms in the presence of oxygen and water. It is the acceleration of the natural decay process. The natural decomposition is compost. that can then be used to add nutrients to and improve the structure of soil naturally. So what do you need? You need six ingredients. You need a carbon source. You need a nitrogen source. You need microorganisms to break down the carbon and the nitrogen. You need oxygen, moisture, and a warm temperature. So Trish brought up a couple of the things that you have to have. Now, frankly, when I was going through the composting program or learning it during our 30 years, I didn't take the master composter program until we had already been composting 28 years. Um, so that's proof that you can be ignorant and still compost. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Trish mentioned carbon and nitrogen. So the next three slides or so, this topic is one that I had a little trouble getting my head around. Um, so I'm gonna try to stay what, with, with what really matters because from a practical standpoint, um, it's nice to know a lot about what's happening, but from a practical standpoint, you can't do much about it. So the term carbon nitrogen was just introduced. So composters refer to things that have a higher that are higher in carbon content as brown. Think about leaves being brown, straw being brown. So it's kind of an imagery of brown 
carbon. Green composters use as things that have less carbon, so the ratio of nitrogen is much higher. So if you think about green as gra grass clippings, sorry, um, a lot of the vegetable waste you might have or kitchen waste um, that you put in your compost is probably green. So if you think about green as having a, from a standpoint of a relationship, um, less carbon and more nitrogen. So the blend of brown and green. So this is kind of a general perspective, but it is what most composters rely on because you're not gonna measure how much carbon you have or how much nitrogen you have. So a proportion. So you're gonna hear things that are called a ratio of carbon to nitrogen, and you're gonna, hurt, I'll use the term ratio. So the compost that works, that results in kind of an optimal blend of carbon and nitrogen is about two thirds of brown and one third of green. You'll read some information that says, well, you have to do it based on weight, not volume, but it, you don't, <laughs> you don't need to. Uh, many times I'll take a five gallon pail fill it with two of them, two, two pails full of chopped leaves and the equivalent pail of kitchen waste. And that's, that's you can use volume. And you can also guess. As you start composting, you do less of that and you just find what's working. And then you adjust a little bit if you think you need to tweak what you're putting in your compost. So carbon and nitrogen, you're putting out material into your compost that is composed of carbon and, and nitrogen. It results in the browns and the greens and you're using that proportion. So now from a ratio standpoint, the ideal ratio is about 30 to one, 30 carbon to one nitrogen. If you do the two to one proportion, it's gonna generally result in that. So why carbon and nitrogen are so important is the microorganisms that are breaking down what you're putting in your compost bin, turning it into compost, the microorganisms need to live. The carbon and the nitrogen is their food. Um, the, the carbon they consume gives them the energy. The nitrogen gives a lot of the proteins and results in their growth, although saying growth and micro in the same sentence is a little bit oxymoronic, but the microorganisms need the carbon and the nitrogen. So they're thriving. It's a little systems in there. They're thriving by eating and feeding on what you're putting in your compost. And as a result, they're giving you compost. They're breaking it down uh, into and, and decomposing it. So they will come to it. You're not gonna start putting your, 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 your waste into a compost bin and then dump in a, a bucket full of microorganisms. They're gonna come. The worms are gonna come, the microorganisms are gonna come and that stuff's all gonna appear naturally and start breaking down. They're gonna start eating that carbon and nitrogen. They're gonna start breaking it down and you'll start getting compost. So one of the things you can say if your compost is taking a little while, you can get some finished compost from somebody, borrow their microorganisms. There's microorganisms in soil, you can put them in there, but they're gonna come and they'll be in your compost. So there's proportions, which is two to one, two brown, one green, and there's a ratio, but the ratio you're not gonna measure. So important thing is things you put in, nothing is gonna be all carbon or all nitrogen. You'll see that in the middle, the, the I'll say the third one down, the autumn leaves is about 50 to one. So there's a ratio of 50 carbon to one nitrogen but it's thought to be more heavily carbon-based. Your food waste, the third from the bottom, 14 to one, it's far more, uh, a lot less carbon, so the ratio causes it to be more nitrogen-centric. So you're not gonna need the formula. You can calculate it. I mean, if you were to add the leaves, you had the, the way the math works, if you add the 50, if you assume the leaves are 50 and the food waste are 14, that's 64, you divide by two, you get a ratio, 32 to one, which is almost dead on what an optimum compost bin is. And we happen, most residential, you're gonna have leaves from trees usually, and you're gonna have your kitchen waste. And those are the primary products you're gonna put in there. And if you put anything else that we talk about later, it's, it's gonna work, but you don't need to go get your compost tested to see what the ratio is. You don't need to really know what these ratios are. You can kind of rely on that proportion of, well, I'm gonna put, a quantity of two buckets full of things that are brown and a bucket full of things that are green and you're gonna find your compost working. 
So <clears throat> decomposing microorganisms require oxygen and water for survival. If you see the picture here, um, this is me today. Um, I was working uh, with the instrument that we have that we use to stir up our pile. And stirring, if we stir it up about twice a month, it'll provide oxygen to the center of the pile. Because you're thinking again about these microorganisms that need oxygen and water. The pile should be damp. So you might want a water source nearby. Um, it shouldn't be wet, but kind of like a, if you take a sponge and you squeeze it out, that kind of, dry, of wetness you need. So if you see in the picture, the left-hand picture looks kind of like, it looks like a corkscrew, although there's no bottle of wine with a that big that has a cork that size, but it works pretty well. This one's plastic, you can get them, they're made out of metal and they're pretty handy. It doesn't take but 15 minutes to screw in a couple holes, pull it out and you have kind of aerated your compost bin. But you can use a pitchfork or a shovel as well. You don't have to have anything like that. Microbes produce heat. So the I so when they make their when they're decomposing products, they will get the temperature up. And the ideal temperature is 90 to 125 degrees uh, for ideal decomposition. So in a hot pile, it's going to decomposition is going to hop, uh, occur a lot quicker. You can get a thermometer, if you see the little picture here of the thermometer, they're quite long and if you can fit it right in the pile and it'll let you know how you're doing. Yeah, that I just don't, that may look like a meat thermometer, but they actually have things, the compost thermometers, you can also- Like this long. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the rate of, of your product decomposing is gonna depend on your carbon nitrogen ratio that Peter discussed, on the presence of microorganisms, how damp your pile is, the temperature outside, like the weather, as well as the interior pile temperature and the amount of oxygen. So let me just, on the carbon to nitrogen ratio, what I mentioned about the importance of the carbon to nitrogen being a food for the microorganisms and uh, things that are creating your compost, um, they can only eat so much. You know, their bellies get full of nitrogen, they're gonna eat more nitrogen. If you have excess nitrogen, that's when you might hear about or, or, or people saying that the compost is starting to get smelly, it, it could, it'll build up some ammonia. So the, the, the portion of carbon to nitrogen, although is pretty, it, it works at a broad, more than just the two to one. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons it's important. So it also depends on your location, um, especially the location to the sun. It would be nice to have your pile in the sun because then it would get nice and hot. But the problem is it tends to dry out. So you want it in a partially shaded area. As far as the size of your pile, ideal is four feet by four feet by four feet. If it's smaller than three feet, then it's hard to hold the temperature. If it's larger than five feet, then it might not allow enough air for the microbes to get oxygen. And then the size of the pieces when of the ingredients that you put into the pile. It should be smaller if you can break things up. Like if you have a, sometimes I have a cantaloupe that rots. I'm so mad I didn't eat it in time. Uh, cut it up into small pieces. Don't just throw it in whole. Although I have, but it's it's better not to. So Trisha started talking about the things that make compost work. Well, one of the things you need is some kind of container. So. In having a container, things to think about is, I mentioned that there really isn't a lot of work and we mentioned that the compost can compost with or without you. Um, but the container, it's, it's easier to take care of if you have a container that helps uh, facilitate aeration. Uh, in this case, you know, this, this one, I have some pictures of others that there's a screen so air can get through it. It's not enclosed. Um, water can get to this. Uh, it might be easy to lift up a lid and, if you have to add some water from your hose or from a rain barrel or something. Uh, in this case, it's open to the weather and agitation. You can see the pitchfork there. You need to be able to get into it in order to turn it over or to use the uh, corkscrew, that type of tool. So there's simple wire cages, somewhat like I showed you before, a wooden bin. Um, 
there's a lot of black rubber plastic bins that are on the internet that are available. Um, there's tumbler bins that really hadn't, hadn't seen really until a couple of years ago. We don't have any experience with it. Um, and you can just make a pile. Uh, our experiences of, we have a wooden bin now, but we were using the plastic bins for years. Here's just a pile. Um, there's another approach where you can dig a pit and you can lay and layer your compost into a pit, cover it over, um, and then eventually dig it out. Um, or you can just let it pile up and it will just, it will eventually break down. These, uh, you can see the, just a hoop of chicken, well, it's not chicken wire, but wire mesh or netting, screening. Um, there's a compost bin there made out of pallets and you can see in these sketches on the right, the different variations. These are the plastic bins and tumblers. Um, you can see, to me, the tumbler seems small and I think it would end up needing a few of them by the time it decomposes and you put things in it. But uh, so I really don't, we don't have any experience with it. This one, some rotate and some tumble. That's a tumbler, some spin. Um, the one on the bottom left, frankly, is exactly like we used for 25 years. We started with one, composted a bit, and then eventually uh, added two more of that. So we have experienced like over 25 years it lasted with that. And um, many municipalities have uh, days where either at the transfer station, the town hall or public works, they'll uh, provide at cost, and I've heard of some being given away, uh, compost bins, and it's usually like those. And if you do buy them, like we had bought them from our local agency is the Southeast Connecticut Regional Resource of SCARA. Um, they sell them at their cost, it's like, you can get for 45 or $50 what is otherwise a hundred and something dollars on the internet. And our experience is that they work really well. Uh, you don't need something huge or elaborate. I am guilty of going overboard. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we found through some research, um, I'm gonna blame Tricia for saying it, wouldn't it be fun to make one of these? So it's a three bin compost. So this is in our backyard. Um, what's kind of handy about this is you can have, compost at different stages as you fill it. You can also have neighbors, friends, and relatives supply compost for you and bring their stuff over. But you can, uh, I was just moving one from the one to the other, but one bin can be for more finished compost. One can be for what you're just putting in. In fact, they use one bin, in this case, the middle, I think, um, just in the fall, a pilot full of leaves, take a weed whacker and stick it in there and, uh, and, and chew it all up and chop it all up and uh, keep that full so that during the course of the year, I can use that for a lot of my uh, browns because the leaves are a really good brown. They're like, I think a magical decomposer. So once you've decided what you're going to put your compost in, you, you have to decide what you're gonna start putting into the um, compost. So this slide is great compost matter. This is the really good stuff to use. So for your carbon source, we have fallen leaves, uh, preferably shredded mainly munch, which is a heat-treated hay, dryer lint, of course, they should be natural products. Uh, soil and egg cells are like a carbon uh, nitrogen neutral. For nitrogen sources, uh, untreated grass clippings, you don't wanna have anything with a herbicide or pesticide if you're gonna be putting this compost in your, gar in your vegetable garden. Um, raw vegetable kitchen waste, fruits and vegetable scraps, blood and bone meals, and plant trimmings cut up. Now the orange print is what we really use. We don't do a lot of little extra things. We, we use what we have. So we have the leaves, we have the eggshells, we have the grass clippings, uh, lots of kitchen uh, waste of fruits and vegetables. Um, and then we have put in plant trimmings but we really don't do that anymore. Yeah. Most of the time we mulch the grass clippings and I think a lot of people do, but occasionally, if I think that we need some nitrogen, uh, if maybe I wanna speed up some of the decomposition, I'll occasionally dump some grass clippings in. And, and frankly, if you don't have a vegetable garden or you're not using your compost for something you're gonna consume, um, if it has been fertilized and you put grass clippings in and you're only gonna put your compost back on the lawn, if, if that's the practice, then I, I think it's a little less issue, less of an issue if you have fertilized your grass clippings or not, if it's just going back in the lawn as compost. I remember when I was learning this, I was like, okay, leaves are carbon, grass is nitrogen. I was having real trouble with that. 
So if the grass dries out, then it's gonna become more carbon, but fresh grass is considered a nitrogen source. And if you look at the bottom of the picture here, um, on the right side is what we have on our kitchen counter. Of course, it has a top. <laughs> and then on the left is what we bring it out to our bin. Yeah, the bottom picture shows that's generally the size of the things that, you know, I might have chopped up the red onion a little bit. The Pillsbury Doughboy, doe boy, make sure we put the right stuff yeah. in the compost. Bin. He checks and makes sure it's the mm -hmm. right stuff. So this is good compost matter. Uh, carbon sources are straw, shredded newspaper. I don't remember, uh, if you remember, newspaper is not printed with lead anymore like it used to be, it's oils. Shredded wood or bark, pine needles, sawdust. Now we don't actually do any of these. Um, we don't, we hardly ever put newspaper in. For nitrogen sources, uh, deadheaded flowers and non-invasive weeds. Uh, coffee grounds and tea leaves, rotted farm stock manure, cow, horse, and poultry, and then myeloorginate, which is a treated sewer sludge, microbes um, so, that are heated and then have digested. So, so this is a good slide to remind you that we, it, what's in orange is our practice, and frankly, we wouldn't, uh, I mean, I, I, we wouldn't put manure, we don't go out and get anything we don't have to put in our compost. Yeah. But again, if you go on the internet or if you go even in the composting programs, like the master composting program, they will explain things that will work, um, but you don't have to do all of it. Um, I, you know, the shredded newspapers, I wish it was more practical to shred newspapers. I just, I don't want to sit there and shred it by hand or, or put them through a shredder, but I would, I'd rather put our newspaper shredded in our compost and let it decompose and turn into compost rather than putting it in recyclable where not sure or certain what becomes of it after it's recycled. If they don't have a buyer for newspapers, it gets incinerated. So that's one thing in the future. I'm gonna try to figure out how to how to reincorporate uh, shredded newspapers. I used to do it a little bit, but it got too tiresome. So this slide says bad compost matter, but it's, the point is that you just it's just trying to say what things should not be put into a compost pile. You don't want to put anything that would attract animals. So no dairy products, no meat or fish scraps, no fats, oils, or salad dressings. Definitely no pet, pet feces because that could have some kind of um, pathogen. No diseased plant material. Uh, coal, no coal, wood, or charcoal, ash, or limestone. These are very alkaline, and so you would not want them in there. No glossy or color magazines and newspapers. Uh, no plants or grass that have pesticides or herbicides, and no invasive weeds. Um, you also, we have a question. Um, yeah. I did get a um, question in the chat, kind of concerning this. If you yeah. guys don't mind, no problem. Um, so Yolanda wants to know if brown paper grocery bags would be uh, suitable for composting if shredded. Oh yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, they're good. We we put some of that in there too. Yeah, we do that a lot when we're getting like if we get a, some corn at the farm, we'll just throw the whole all the cobs we'll, and we'll, we'll husk the corn, the put the husks too. in the bag, and just throw it in the compost. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. works really well. Yeah, and the uh, and matter of fact, we talked about eggs and eggshells. Frankly, the the cardboardish material that you can get egg, a lot of egg cartons in, certainly not the plastic. We just tear that up and throw that in the compost bin as well. Good question. Yeah. So this is our compost, uh, our finished product. Uh, not quite finished. Well, not quite finished. So you, it really should be, uh, you shouldn't be able to recognize some of um, what these materials are and you can kind of see what they are. So we're not, it's not quite done. Um, finished compost should have a pleasant earthy smell. It should be dark brown. Uh, when it's finished, it, it has a, carbon nitrogen ratio of 15 to one. It's very neutral, it's not acid or basic. And it'll take about two to four months in a warm growing season. So over the summer, it would take about two to four months. So active composting requires turning a three to four foot high compost pile with a balance of green and brown materials and monitoring for moisture and oxygen. So as I mentioned at the beginning with the frequently asked questions, some, some folks that want to compost, but don't think they 
no, they don't know what to do with it other than they might put it in their garden. Um, a lot of times we'll take it, I'll mix it with some topsoil and use that for filling in depressions in the yard, put grass seed over it and then cover it with, again with some mix of topsoil and, and compost. Um, it makes a, a great way to start uh, or rehabilitate some lawn. We added around plants just sprinkling it around. Uh, brewing compost tea is pretty cool. You take the compost, put it in like a nylon stocking or some filtered material and put it in a watering can with water in it for a couple of days, and then use that to water plants, either inside house plants or outside. Works pretty well, works very well. Um, Could I, we ask uh, one more chat question? Yeah, it, yeah. Since it's just concerning um, what you guys are talking about. So uh, Sheila wants to know if the brown grocery bags have print on them, is that yes. okay? Yeah, the print's insignificant. And most, as she mentioned with the newspapers, the ink they use now is compostable, it's not, um, Poisonous, I guess is the way to put it, um, and the and the same thing, the prints on the on the on the bags, it's it's, it's there's nothing wrong with it. It'll it'll break down and compost, and it, it is not going to it's not detrimental. Any of the grocery bags that we have and that type of thing. Uh, where, oh yeah, um, you can just spread it out. You don't even have to mix it with topsoil. You can just scatter it to the wind and let it fall on the lawn. You know, just take a shovel and just kind of swoosh it out there. Um, you can give away your compost to people that. Don't compost. Um, there's a, also just the point when you're when you're putting your compost in places. There's a kind of a clause in our master gardener certification that says stress that it's a good idea to have a soil test so you kind of know what the condition of your soil is, whether it's in the garden or whether it's in your lawn, um, so that you know generally what you're adding to it, what it could do to it, um, so that you generally keep it as as healthy soil. And the the, the soil lab at UConn for a couple eight, five bucks, eight bucks, I think you mail in some samples. It's really not hard to go do. And you can get a soil test that'll, that'll tell you how healthy your soil is. I think, I think it's gone up to 12 bucks now. Yeah. But um, we only do it every couple of years. We found out doing our soil test that we were adding too much compost. To our vegetable garden. You can actually do that. So it's a good idea if you do have a vegetable garden or a flower garden or a lawn to get your soil test. So... We're, so I don't have really a good slide that does a segue, but that's the, the kind of the backyard compost portion of this. Um, the, what we're going, so from a residential standpoint, there's also another type of composting called vermicomposting. So we have a very high level, just a few slides to explain what that is because it does come up in discussions and it is something homeowners do. Um, although it's not literally in your backyard, um, this vermicomposting uh, takes place indoors. So, so this is indoor composting, aka verma composting. Verma means worms, and so this is this is our cellar, and this is where we have a bin, and um, there's worms in there. Uh, we use moistened shredded paper for them to eat, as well as food waste. They produce the worm castings, and and it doesn't smell, and it, it's um, it's a way to to do some. Uh, composting inside. So in the picture, we have the big gray bin that um, um, is used with the, the, where the worms are, I call them treatises, pet worms. Um, we have a little water can because you want to keep it moist. Um, and also we, they do love shredded paper. So this is a case where you are going to, if you vermicompost, use a lot of uh, newspaper shredded up. Uh, I, Tricia took the master composter program certification a couple of years before I ultimately did. And she came back from one of the workshops where they were learning about vermicomposting and building worm bill, bins as kind of a project. Came back and said, hey, guess what? We're gonna have worms, we'll put them in the basement. I, 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 we have enough pets. So <laughs> I, it didn't make any sense to me. And I didn't understand the reason for it. Just took, took me a little while to understand why carbon and nitrogen is even part of the discussion because it's kind of a circle of life. They're the food for the things that break down the compost and such. Um, well, it's just, it's manure. Um, what you get from vermicomposting is worm manure, just like there's cow manure, horse manure. In this case, it's worm manure and it's extremely good compost. So plants um, thrive by having nitrogen, phosphorus and pot potassium. It's kind of the, the kind of the mantra is up, down, all around. Nitrogen for plant growth up, phosphorus for strong root structure, that's the down, and then potassium for all around plant health. and and the compost the, 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 that you get from the worms, the castings, which is their poop, um, is, is a really good source for this. 
You're not going to get a dump truck worth out of a little bin like we have, but you get enough to use and facilitate as an amendment around your your garden. Um, The worms facilitate decomposition. They're in there busy eating up things and and giving you their manure. They break down what they eat. They secrete a lot of fluids. It keeps it moist. um, And they are a microbiotic activity. So if your outside is not available and you just want a small amount of composting and you have a small amount of kitchen scraps, um, this, this would be a good thing to do. Um, and, and it makes great nutrients for plants. Uh, if you have kids or grandchildren, um, they would love to be interested and, and see this kind of thing. Yeah, that, so we've taken the worms on the road um, to some science fairs at elementary schools particularly. And they are like a kid magnet. I mean, they, they, when you explain it to them, but it really gets them energized. They're like, oh, worms, aren't they cool? And then you get into the discussion about the process of it. And, um, it, and it becomes really a very engaging experience. Um, and, and, and of course, they like to touch them and feel them. And frankly, the worms seem to like to entertain kids. So the most important thing about this is you can't use earthworms. Earthworms, would, they want to tunnel. They don't want to be captive. Uh, this is a specific worm, uh, Icena fetida uh, is a Latin name. And if you were ever to order any worms or get any worms, you want these kind of worms. These are the best for vermicomposting. Um, if they were to escape, they would, would not cause damage to the native uh, ecosystems in New England because they won't overwinter here. Uh, they, they wouldn't last. So they're strictly... You just have to use these kind of worms. So it's it's possible that in your compost bin, it's likely you're going to have earthworms. It's possible some red wigglers could be in the environment and could get there. They're just like Trisha said, they're not, they don't, they don't like the cold weather. There are some people, and we had a presentation of someone that does vermicomposting outside in New England, and they go through the trouble of putting like hay bales around their vermicompost bin and keep them insulated in the winter. But it's... Hasn't been a real problem having the worms in the basement. All right, we've got um, one question about yeah. vermicomposting. Um, yeah. So someone wants to know they're interested in it, but they're concerned about attracting rodents and um, smells. Yeah, they, it, do, it, it doesn't smell. Um, they, and, and they're not, um, they're, they're in a container and there's air holes in the container, but rodents, nothing can get in there. And it, we, the picture we showed, it, it was open, but there's a top on it. We've never had any rodents or any mice. And, and occasionally yeah. we do have mice. We've never had an issue with um, anything getting into it that we didn't want in it. So I don't think that's a, I don't think that would be a concern. Yeah, we, we haven't had a problem. No, and this, and it's, and it's not, it's not a, not and a, I think we've no. had them four or five years. Yeah. I mean, we've had them a long time. Yeah. 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 And they, they multiply, there's, I, we don't have a, the data on it, but there's an insane reproductive cycle on these where if you start with a hundred worms in three months, you could have 3000. Um, and, and frankly, there's a network of people that share and give away worms when people want to vermicompost. And, uh, and, and it, I'm not saying that people don't have anything else to do and worms seems like a strange hobby, but it, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh-huh. Um, so no rodents and this, it, it's, I don't even think it's a musty smell, right? We don't smell anything different. Our basement's not really musty. We have a dehumidifier. So it, it really doesn't uh, provide anything. But again, you don't you, you keep it in balance. I mentioned with the carbon and nitrogen, you can't put more nitrogen in than the microorganisms can eat or you have excess nitrogen, it might smell. So you keep it in balance. When things are breaking down and you're getting the result, um, the volume of result is right, um, it, it all works and you don't have some of those ill effects like smells. So the care and feeding of your worms, uh, this is similar to regular composting. You need a dry, moist environment. The temperature should be about 50 to 80 degrees. That's why our basement works really well. Uh, The skin of the worm must be moist in order to breathe. They need just a small amount of food. I I feed them once a week uh, and try to make sure they have plenty of, you know, everything's moist. And then you cover the food to make sure you you can attract fruit flies. That's one thing. So you have to cover cover the food with the newspaper. And then you would feed your worms similar things that you would put in the compost, leftover tea bags, fruit cores, vegetables, coffee grounds, eggshells. This says leftover grain and rice. I I don't do that kind of thing. Um, 
and you never add meat, dairy, fish, paper with bright colors, uh, pet feces. And for some reason, they do not eat citrus, onions, cabbage, and of course they wouldn't eat seeds either. Um, so if you put seeds in there by accident, they might start growing. Um, but they do eat the newspaper, that's their other source. So we touched on a lot of information um, for backyard composting, kind of the way it works. I touched on kind of getting started. We tried to present it in a way that doesn't make someone say, oh my God, there's no way I'm gonna go try it. Cause um, our hope is always that someone that isn't composting will start composting uh, because it, it does have a lot of value and, and not just because of the waste. I mean, it, it really makes sense. I think, we think at least, that's why we do it. Um, there's a lot of references. I could have, we could have 20 slides of references. Um, these are some that we found um, pretty good. Uh, I didn't put a lot of the internet sources because if you Google gardening and look at some of the universities that again, it would be a .edu, those are really reliable. And some of them, and I mentioned Missouri, University of Missouri have a really good index where you can pick little topics and get it. And I find them to be well written. I mean, if I understand it, I'm gonna assume most everybody else can. And then um, UConn, and UConn does have the Master Composter Program. So just before I leave the topic on composting programs, um, University of, of Vermont um, has an online, they were not, not remote because of the pandemic, but they've been online with their Master Composting Program for quite a number of years. Um, we've seen some of it, but it's supposed to be pretty good. If you're from out of state, you can sign up and you can go through the program. You can get all the information, um, the, the, the material, um, the resources. You won't get certified because you need to do projects and unless you're in Vermont in the group, you can't really do that, but you can get all the information. And getting certified in the program is, it's good, but frankly, having the information is what's really important if you're going to compost. But Connecticut has a master composter, composter program yeah. also. Yeah, it is, it, is, it, it is designed to be in person. So it's like four nights, uh, two nights a week. And then there's uh, field trips. Um, and also the website at UConn for composting is very good. And Dawn Pitnelli is really user-friendly. If you were to email her and she's runs the program, uh, should answer a lot of your questions. Matter of fact, any question we may get, we can't answer, which probably a lot of them, she would probably be a, a great resource or that we'd probably turn to. Um, and then um, Cornell, Univers Cornell University has a really, they have a manual that is, their program is also um, how to compost. And it is also very good. It's not as uh, interactive. It's more like a hard copy that's online, but it's really good, really good information. Uh, as a resource. So there's our contact information again. Um, we don't mind being contacted. And uh, if there's, I don't know, if there's any other questions in the chat or how you want to open it up, then we can try to address it and we can go back slides if anybody has a question on a specific slide. Oh, looks like one just came through. Let me read this. Okay. So, um, Sheila says that you hit upon one of her questions. She tried vermica composting years ago, but all her worms died. Um, I guess it was a bad company and wrong time of year. But she also wants to know, um, there's a lot of internet resources tell her not to put um, citrus peels and onions in the composter, but is it okay if there's no worms since they won't um, eat that? In the, in the, well, so for vermicomposting, there, there's clearly worms, but for composting outside, yeah, they, so the outside where you're gonna have a lot of earthworms and microorganisms, you can put all that kind of um, vegetative onions, um, citrus, um, they, it breaks down. The microorganisms love it. Worms might not touch it, but there's a lot of other organisms in there that are gonna decompose it and break it down. So it is, it is fine. You're not, you're not gonna assassinate any, yeah, any worms. That was just for the indoor verma composting were those restrictions. Yeah, where they don't, they don't, they don't, uh, they do it. And, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your worms. Hmm. Okay, we also have one um, asking if you guys have any guidance on commercially sold worm towers. Wait, I, I've seen pictures of them online, but we don't, we don't, we really don't. 
I, I know, Trisha, have you run into it at all? Mm-hmm. Worm towers. Oh. You, can, you can go online and buy a worm no, tower. No, I don't. No, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm sorry. We, we, yeah. we, we don't, we don't know. Um, nor have we ever tried it. Sorry. It's <laughs> all right. Um, okay. So another one, um, uh, someone says they've seen that, um, they have an Arabin, which says it doesn't need to be rotated would be grateful for any insight or advice you may have with this particular compost. Okay, so that, so it's for compost to decompose um, at a rate that you might want, you're gonna have to aerate it in some, in some way. The, uh, the organisms need air, it, it needs to circulate through there. Um, so I'm not sure how it would work if it didn't, if it was at that type of, if it didn't, you're gonna have to turn it over. So Victoria, could you, could you read the question again? Make sure I understand. Um, yeah, she said I have an aerobin which um, says that it doesn't need to be rotated, um, and yeah. she's looking for advice on yeah. this particular compost. I don't. I'm not that familiar with it. I'm. I'm guessing it has some mechanism that um, keeps it aerated without needing to rotate it or manually interact with it in some way. I'm not familiar with it. Um, another one. It, it, uh, I know. I know. I I, I got asked. Has it has it been working? Have, has it has it been generating compost? Let's see if we get a response. Uh, while we wait, if yeah. uh, we get a response, someone's asking if mold is indicative of the pile being imbalanced or too moist. Too moist. Is it so? You really sh- so well. I frankly, some of the some of our kitchen waste we put out there already has mold on it, but it it still decomposes. Mold's really not a problem. Uh-huh. I mean, it it probably helps decompose yeah. whatever's in there in itself because it's got microorganisms and yeah, it's and, already and bacteria, it's so already it's decomposing. So mold going. is okay. That's good. Um, so mold certainly likes water, you probably don't have to do anything to it. I, I, it. So the compost, the way it's described, I know our compost is too dry and I have to go water it once in a while. Um, if you squeeze it, you know, it should feel like kind of a damp sponge is the, cle- I, you know, everybody says that, use that term. Uh, you know, maybe a little cushy, it'll get a little water out of it. Um, if you have a lot of water running out of it, then it can dry out some, but it's, it's really not a problem. And the mold's not a problem. So um, follow up of for the the rotating question. Um, I guess uh, they only started a few weeks ago, but they see mold on the pile, moldy fuzz on the pile um, from not rotating. I guess. So I would start. I'm go- I'm not being implied. I'm going online to see what it looks like. <laughs> see me. So an insulin compost bin. Insulated? I don't know. I, I, I don't want to take a uh, sidetrack everything, but I have to look at it. It looks like it's got some kind of way of recirculating air in some way. Bottom doors. Sounds like it has some way of, of, of kind of naturally circulating air through it. But again, the mold is. The mold's okay. I, you know, if the, I tell you, if the whole thing, if you, all your compost got started covered, covered in mold, um, it probably is too moist. I, temperature shouldn't be a problem. I'd, I'd have to look at that. I, I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll look at that product yeah, a little bit, but I'm not familiar with that 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 um, bin. It sounds like someone's trying to make it easier to compost, which is always good, but I don't know how it works. Um, Sorry again. <laughs> um, I, someone's also asking about the citrus peels again. Did we, did you conclude that their citrus peels and onions are okay even without earthworm, when there aren't no earthworms? Yeah, not, so again, citrus is not okay for your vermicomposting indoors with your red wigglers. Right. Citrus is great in an outdoor compost bin. It'll, it'll, it'll compost and decompose great. And it's good food for the other microorganisms. Worms will just probably leave it alone. So yeah, citrus is citrus is good outdoors in your compost bin. Okay. 
Good for citrus. And um, onion. Go ahead, did you? <laughs> Okay, um, and Tonya wants to know, um, what is in the bags of compost starter to move the process along? Starter yeah, and yeah, what I understand, most of them have some microorganisms and it's generally, you know, kind of a, a, a compost. It's probably got um, nitrogen is kind of a kickstarter for, for some composts. Um, it gets it kind of percolating pretty quickly. So manure, is also used sometimes as a starter. So I'm not, without knowing exactly what the product is, it probably has some combination of, of some higher nitrogen um, components from what I understand. We've never, we never used it. Never used so I don't have experience with it, but I know I've seen it on the market. Um, I, generally speaking, you, you know, when you go through like the composter program, the speakers generally say it really isn't necessary. Wow. Compost is one of those things that just, it just, it just. It's occurring anyway. <laughs> so you just want to make it go faster. So that's where the air, water, really and, and aerating it, you know, again, making sure that it has passage for the air. It, it will, it will decompose. And like I said, if you put it outside, the worms are going to find it. The microorganisms will find it uh, and it'll start, it'll start breaking down. I think it's harder to stop it than start it. Hmm. Right. So to answer your question, most, I think, composters because they that have experience will say you probably don't need to buy a starter, but the starter's probably got something higher in nitrogen that's going to bring the heat up pretty quickly, and that'll kind of kickstart the process. It, it it could work. I we just never tried it. 